Hello, listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of I Never Knew But My Dog Did podcast. I am Maureen Scanlon, your host or life coach Maureen, as most of you know me. And actually, I'm happy to announce I'm now master life coach Maureen. Yeah. I just achieved something that that makes me extremely proud, and I, I I feel so accomplished in the fact that I knew it. I didn't need the title, but I got the the credentialing, and I'm so proud of that. So here we are, and I was just talking to our next guest offline, and I love how we are so humble about the things that we do. And she says, "Well." my story is kind of boring compared to the people that are in my book. And I said to her, you are not boring. You are fantastic. And, and we need you in the world to bring the information, the love and these experiences to others. And that's why we have her here today. So listeners, I have such a treat for you today. So I have Deborah Charns today. She was riddled with chronic low back pain and digestive orders since childhood. And she spent 50 years exploring the world, uncovering secrets to health and happiness, which we all are looking for, right? We want the secret. For two decades, she managed hundreds of news conferences, editorial board meetings, press meeting briefings, and one-on-one -on -one interviews. She worked with security communications and advanced teams for John McCain, near and dear to my Arizona heart, Hillary Clinton, President Barack Obama, oh, and my favorites as well, First Lady Michelle Obama, then Vice President Joe Biden, Dr. Jill Biden, Bernie Sanders, megastar, what, what, Jennifer Lopez, and the Vice President of El Salvador. All right, listeners, put your chin back up, push your chin up, because I know what. So to balance the chaotic skills directing major league campaigns, it was essential for her to soothe the stress and 24-7 schedule with mind, body, and soul lifesavers. So Deborah left the high-pressure demands as an international corporate marketing communication strategy, strategist. She dedicated that same energy to positive transformation of herself and others, which I love. So you go from this super busy life to really finding purpose. So she was a certified yoga teacher. She added additional training in Ayurvedic massage. I hope I said that right. Therapy, nutrition, and cooking. She received certification in multiple holistic modalities. And after an additional 800 hours of specialized training, became one of the first bilingual English-Spanish certified yoga therapists in Texas. I could go on and on and on. She is not boring. Am I right, listeners? Welcome, my new friend of the podcast, Deborah. Thank you. So nice to be here. I love it. We found out that she's she's already a neighbor, but she's now going to be a closer neighbor to me here in Texas, here in Austin. And she also does retreats. So at the end of the podcast, you guys, we're going to tell you all about everything that she does, how you can go to her retreats, how you can get her book and talk to her. So this is really fascinating because usually we start off with our knee story here on I Never Knew, like, when was your life so bad? You were on your knees and you wanted to change. And I really love that you said, I want to talk about all the gurus that I've met and their experiences. And I am all about that. So let's talk about your journey from corporate America to now you meeting all of these gurus and being in this beautiful holistic space. Tell us all about that journey. Wow. Um, I would say it's something that I always was on. I just had to suppress it. And in fact, one of my gurus in my book is somebody that I met through my work in 1989. Oh. So that was a very long time ago. <laughs> And I was wearing a totally different hat. I was doing totally different. I was in a different lifestyle. I was living in South America. 
And he also was a very different person in terms of who his persona is from who he is now. And so if I can, I'll just share a little bit about what it was. Aside from the fact that I've worked marketing communications my entire life, I also opened and ran and managed um, a little restaurant cafe bar in South America. And I did, of course, all the marketing. I did. I worked with the designers and the interior decorator. I came up with the name, of course, and I got the TV crews there. And, you know, I did I did everything. I actually we filmed the South American version of Candid Camera there. I mean, we did, you know, all sorts of things. So again, I never left my marketing communications world, yeah. but I was wearing an apron and I was serving coffee, making co- making coffee, serving it and taking in all the money, working the cash register. And one of my daily customers And I had like a a little bar area. It was kind of European style. So I had a bar area. So they, many of our clientele would come in every day for coffee and I made cheesecake from scratch and I made other things as well. And so one of my clients or my customers, he worked in the, um, a couple floors above me in the same building. So he and his business partner would come in all the time together or separate and they would drink their coffee and they would have some of my homemade dessert and they would chat. And he was just a normal guy, right? (laughs) (laughs) What's normal, right? Okay. (laughs) You know what? He was a normal guy, but he had a very unusual first name. Anyway. Fast forward, I sold the business, I moved to Miami, and I'm immersed, of course, in the marketing communications world. And one night I turn on the news and I hear, because I'm multitasking, I'm always multitasking. So I just hear that a man with this very unusual name was running for vice president of the country. And again, I'm just listening. And then they interviewed him and I recognized his voice, not only his voice, but his slight, um, you know, a regional accent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the man that I knew. So then I started to follow him, but also they, they mentioned in the news that he was a paraplegic. What? Obviously, when I knew him, you know, he was not, he walked up and down the stairs to his office. So I researched to see what happened. He had been the victim of an assault. He had been left paraplegic. He had many different operations. He was almost bedridden for about four years. And of course, severe depression sets in, of course. Yeah. Aside from dealing with all of the pain, he can no longer do what he's used to doing. He took every drug imaginable. It didn't help. And then he found laughter as therapy. He read, I believe, Norman Cousins' book. And anyway, he became the biggest advocate for laughter as therapy. He ended up becoming, of course, vice president. And then he was named by General Ban Ki-moon to head the global, um, the global, I don't know, you call it department or whatever for people that um, um, differently abled people. And so he moved to Geneva and he was doing that. And then as he was in Geneva, as he says, people told him that he should come back and run for president. And they told him, because he, of course, tries to always tell jokes. And of course, I can't tell a joke, so you can laugh, but it won't be funny when I tell it. But he says, they told me to come back. The, The table was, the table was ready. I'm missing the joke. And he said, there wasn't even a table. So he did go back 
And sure enough, he became the first wheelchair bound president um, of Latin America. Oh my goodness. That is, I mean, how do you get more inspirational than that? I mean, really, listeners, can you only imagine you're this able-bodied person and you're living your life. You see him just coming in, hanging out with friends, going to work. And then you find out this, this terrible traumatic thing happens to him. And for four years, he goes into this depression and bedridden. And yet he overcomes the whole theme of this podcast, guys, is overcoming to become the first president, the first um, wheelchair bound president of a Latin American country. I mean, wow, mind blown. Um, and so how did you connect with him and catch up with him and, and end up working together with him? Actually, I didn't, but I followed his trajectory the entire time. And as a yoga teacher, I always try to inspire and uplift my students. And long before he was president, when I first saw the news about him and the fact that he was running for vice president, and I would use his story all the time to inspire my students and to give them uplifting messages. So I was always talking about him because he was a role model to me. Yeah. And again, to me, it's not about you know, the politics, it's about overcoming adversity and accepting what you're dealt with yeah. and making, not only making the most of what you're dealt with, but changing the lives of others. And that's the thing that, you know, he set out to as president and as vice president. And of course, when he was in Geneva to do whatever he could to help other people, not only in his situation, but any people that had special needs, whether it be AIDS, whether it be um, uh, orphans, you know, anything. He had the compassion for the people that needed more assistance. And he, if you remember the movie Patch Adams, he met with um, the real Patch Adams, Patch was portrayed by Robin Williams in the movie, but he met with the real Patch Adams several times. And even again, even as president, he was still talking about the importance of laughter as medicine. Wow, boy, our leaders could take a page out of his book and I love what I love too is that the the synchronicity of the fact that he wouldn't have been on your radar really but you you were and I'm going to say this when when you were telling me everything you were doing my jaw was dropping and I'm mind blown because you're such a little busy bee I mean running a restaurant alone is a full-time job and all that other stuff you're you're a multitasker um genius as it sounds like but I love that you can say the president ate my cheesecake so you know the fact that he crossed your path and I think that's an important lesson right is never take for granted the people that are crossing your path you don't know and I believe everyone that does cross your path they're serving a purpose they're teaching us where they're learning from us or they're just giving us a story or a nugget of wisdom I completely believe that we should not be oblivious to everyone that comes across our path I think it's important don't you agree I do, but you just gave me the best sound bite that I've got to remember forever. The president ate my cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. There you go. That's right. I love that. So I love that you took that story of his and that experience. Um, and I also believe sometimes we have experiences that, yeah, they're they're tough, they're struggles, they're painful. But I believe sometimes we're, we receive them because we're strong enough to handle them. And also, how could we be as empathetic if we haven't felt what they felt? 
and I think him being able to do the special needs and the different abled um, advocacy is so crucial. Myself going through domestic violence, I can now speak to someone and say, I've been there. I've done that. I know how you feel. Don't you agree with that? Totally. And if I can, I can share some of the words that I've quoted from him in my book. Absolutely. My book is called From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. And another one of my gurus who overcame amazing diversities was a boxer. But um, I'll just read some of his quotes. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind his quotes, I translated them from Spanish to English. So, okay. of course, it's, you know, it's not 100%. For too long, the disabled were ignored. Don't forget there was a time when disabilities were considered illnesses. Disabilities were also considered a punishment from God. People with mental challenges were considered demonic. They were outcasts of the outcasts. They were denied any possibility of social connections. They were hidden and shunned. And then he talks about um, you know, what he did. And he said, I should say with great satisfaction that our country, this is again, while he was in power, is now the most advanced when it comes to promoting the rights of the disabled. And I have to say, we in the United States tend to think that we're the most advanced, you know, <laughs> and we tend to think that other countries are far behind. And so, you know, I think this is really impressive. And he says, he talks about what he did when he was, um, when he was vice president. And then he talks about diversity in general. And he says, we have diversity in climate and topography and biology, even in the way people dress in our language, our customs, folklore, and historic facts, and also among human beings. At birth, some people may be labeled differently abled compared to others who may be considered fully abled, but that is not correct. The term disabled does not define someone. We really have no proper term to define us. A small child may not be able to reach up to change a light bulb, or because of lack of coordination, a youngster cannot tie his or her shoelaces, but we don't call them disabled. So that, that's, that's just a little bit of an idea of some of the reasons why he inspires me so much. And again, it's beyond um, others that are paraplegic. You know, it's yeah. just anyone that is different. And, and that's, you're exactly right. That's unfortunately how the perspective have, has been for so long. And I'm so happy we have advanced to more understanding, especially when it co comes to uh, mental illness and um, like say autism and ADHD. And, you know, it's interesting to me it that now that I'm in the mental health field and I'm an advocate for this, that we can now accept ourselves with this. And now we're welcoming one another and saying, I don't see you any differently and I'm here for you. And with the differently abled, I, I completely agree. I interviewed a gentleman, um, podcast guest who was blind and everybody's like, oh, I feel so bad for you. And he said, don't feel bad for me. He goes, I never knew what it was like to see. So I'm not missing anything. And I thought that was such a cool perspective. In fact, he survived 9-11. He was in the North Tower and he got out with a seeing eye dog. Yeah, that's one of our episodes. So he um, is just fantastic. So thank you for reading that. I can't wait to, to read your book because especially reading that excerpt, I just, I want to know more. So Wow, you have traveled so much. Tell me about um, some of your therapeutic workshops that you've created um, and you have great, great names. So Dem Bones, Gutsy Yoga, Chill Out, Breath of Life, Chant and Be Happy, Tummy Bust, and Sugar Drop. I love those names. It makes me just want to go and do it right now. So tell us about those workshops. What are they like? Well, I am a yoga therapist and what I tell people all the time, because nobody really knows what a yoga therapist is yeah. and they always think it's all about yoga. And what I tell them 
And for some yoga therapists, and maybe some yoga therapists are also physical therapists. Some yoga therapists are MDs or RNs or psychotherapists. We all have to have certain credentials and we have to pass the same um, tests and we have to have, again, the same um, background, but we all are different, <laughs> just like everyone is different. And so my form of yoga therapy taps very much into traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. And I always say, my form of therapy is yoga therapy is more therapy than yoga. Oh. And as an example, my next workshop that I'm leading in Austin, by the way, so I'd love to see you there, but I'm it's going. Austin, and it's called fly first, love yourself. And I believe everyone needs not only to fly, but they need to refresh they need like little boosts and they need a little, little uplifts and perks to get them flying again. So even if you think you already first love, you already love yourself, we all need more. And what I do in my first love yourself workshops is we start with a cacao ceremony. It's a short cacao ceremony. The focus is on sipping the cacao and because cacao is a heart opener. Oh. And then I lead them in guided meditations and I read introspective thought starters and poetry as they are in restorative yoga poses that are for the opening of the heart. And then between each of the poses, we oftentimes will jot down on three by five cards, you know, whatever, whatever I was prompting them to think about. And just as an example, one of the exercises, and of course, every class is totally different, but one of the exercises that I like to do is I like people as they are in the restorative pose. And when you're in a restorative pose, you can be in it for 10 minutes. And so that's why I do, you know, the guided meditation or the talking through um, to stimulate the ideas going on in their head. And one of the things that I like to do is I like them to go back to their childhood and think of the name calling. Because it's so common that kids name call. And unfortunately, many of those tags stay with us forever yeah. even if they are completely untrue we still think of what we were called when we were a child whether it be from other children or whether it's a parent or a teacher telling us you're not good enough you can't sing you're not coordinated you're fat you cry too much i mean those we hear those all the time. There are so many things that we hear that are negative critiques that bruise us for far too long. So what I do is I have them go back, find what that bruise was, and then either erase it or mold it into something else. Ah. Oh. I love that so much because it is, it's like a splinter that festers. And, and even if we try to convince ourselves out of it, sometimes it's just in that subconscious and clearing that subconscious out is important. At every parent teacher conference, the, my mother would come home and she'd say, yep, your grades were wonderful. But once again, we were told you talk too much. Well, guess what? I talk too much. And now I'm a podcast host, a professional speaker and a life coach. So there's that. What do you do with that and and I love that you say we're gonna take what those things were those labels that we had and we're gonna make that our superpower we're gonna make that our uniqueness and it's a good thing it's really about the perspective of saying uh, whatever someone said about me is not as important as what I say about me right that is such a perfect example of how a negative 
I, I don't even know why it's a negative labeling because it shouldn't be negative, but it is perceived as negative because it's, um, it's, again, it, it's, you're not, you know, we're taught to just, you know, be quiet and follow orders. Yeah. And again, who's to say that that's right? And so that's a perfect example of that negative name calling that in fact is a blessing. Right. It's from and somebody else's projection. So, you, you know, my mother wanted me to be seen and not heard. The teacher wanted me to be seen and not heard. And I had a lot to say from birth and I still have a lot to say. <laughs> and you know what? And thank God you do. And you I always did. That's wonderful. I use it for good. And, and yeah, you're absolutely right. I would get, oh, I was, I was dramatic or I was a spaz, which in my now I'm, I'm a spaz, but I'm not as that negative um, label actually is I'm a multitasker. I'm high energy. I keep going. I'm a go getter. I've got five different businesses. So yeah, I am a spaz and it works for me. So I love so much everything that you do and, and that you, you take what we've perceived all of our lives that was negative about us and bad and fly, let's fly. Let's first love ourselves. And I just think that's so beautiful. And the names I'm going, I'm going to your next one. So uh, we didn't get to meet in person. I love that. So tell us about those getaways, those namaste getaways that you do here in Texas. Well, I have a, what I call a mini retreat center. I'm on two acres. It's depending on where you are in Austin, it can be less than an hour or again, depending on where you live, it could be more than an hour. And it's also about an hour away from San Antonio. It's in a beautiful, pristine area. I'm looking out right now and seeing all my beautiful trees. And it's also a dark skies or dark nights community, which means that we don't have street lights. So last night, for example, was beautiful to see the stars. And, you know, it's wonderful for stargazing. It's a very quiet area. And I'm on two acres. I, the first night, I slept here. I slept on a yoga mat <laughs> and I created a labyrinth, a meditation labyrinth. So, mm -hmm. and I smudged, of course, the first thing I did was smudging. So that shows you what some of my priorities are. <laughs> <laughs> cleansing. We're always cleansing. We, we are all about the energy fields, aren't we? And, and I love that you said that about your, about your, your yoga therapy is, even though we think I'm in this really good place, our energy is shifting day by day and new things are getting inserted, new energies, people, experiences. So it changes all the time. I love that you said sometimes we need a refresh and, and I would so agree with that. And I, I love that about your retreats that it's just peaceful. Isn't nature the most peaceful healing thing that we could do? Which brings me to... What we talked about in your bio was that you had chronic back pain. And this is something that stood out for me because I also have chronic back pain and yoga is difficult. I have, it's off camera, but I have a yoga trapeze and I just got that for my birthday and it's been helping me. Plus I walk a lot. We have a lake here in Pflugerville and it's three miles around it. And medication, I, I had a reaction to medication, long-term medication, anti-inflammatories, a really bad one that ended me in the ER with gastritis. And I took myself off of all that. I don't like medication, but it is a struggle. So I want to know, they say, they, whoever they are, I saw this the other day that women over 50, that two out of five out of every five women over 50 have chronic back pain. What, what can we do yoga wise or mind wise that can help us relieve that without having to go with medications? Well, first of all, um, one of the statistics, because I, I, um, I did a lot of promotion for pain, national pain month or whatever it's called, which was the month of September. So we just kind of came out of it 
and one out of five Americans suffers from chronic pain and back pain is the number one form of pain, uh, of chronic pain. And unfortunately regarding medications, and I'm not talking about yours, I'm just talking about in general and our medical community, the Centers for Disease Control has long said that doctors should first encourage people to do holistic treatments such as Tai Chi and yoga and acupuncture before prescribing any opioids. So again, that is something that the Centers for Disease Control came out with a statement maybe 10 years ago. And yet last year, there were more, more than 100,000 opioid related deaths in the United States. That to me is completely unacceptable, but it's unbelievable. Yeah. So the first thing that I want, to, well, actually there's so many things I wanna talk about, but talking about acceptance and loving yourself and seeing, you know, taking the negative and making it into a positive, my back pains began when I was an adolescent and they were severe when I would stand and sit up. I went to a top ranked orthopedic surgeon and thank God he told me that what I needed to do was strengthen the core, which now as a yoga therapist, I know that that is routine. And he also had me work on my posture because I have, um, I was born with a slight deviation in the, in the spine. Again, there's nothing wrong with it, but <laughs> you know, you can remold your body. And, but the other thing I want to mention is that one of the chapters in my book from the boxing room to the ashram, it features, features a guru of mine who began studying yoga a long time ago in the 1960s in India, 60s or 70s in India, he studied directly with BKS Iyengar, who was, you know, tops in the yoga field. And then this man became an MD, and then he specializes now, he is a physiatrist, which is more structural type of medicine. In my mind, he is the leading person, regardless of what his credentials are for back pain. And also, um, I hate to use the word abnormalities, but deviations of the spine. So for example, things like scoliosis or um, sciatica. So to me, he is the leading specialist. He has been researching this for 20 or 30 years. His research studies have included 2000 people. I mean, it it's not like, oh yeah, I did a study with 20 people and this is what came out. And so bottom line, you need to, of course, have a diagnosis because what's right for you may be wrong for me. And for example, when you have, talking about older women in particular, if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, in yoga, you should, afford, you should avoid rounding your back in a forward fold. So I'm just going to kind of show you. So it's common that we kind of do like a ragdoll pose in yoga, a forward fold, Uttanasana. I tell people to do Ardha Uttanasana, which is flat back. So I'm keeping my spine long and flat as opposed to rounding down. The same thing if you are seated because there is more um, potential for fractures if you have osteoporosis. At the same time, People with spinal stenosis, you know, they, or people with, um, what are they called? Uh, when there's an inflammation between the discs, can't think of what it's called, but depending on where they are, oftentimes you cannot arch your back, rounding the back is gonna be more comfortable. So again, what's right for one person may be totally wrong for another person. And what I see all the time as a yoga therapist is somebody comes to me and they say, 
I have arthritis, whatever, or I have sciatica. I always hear, you know, so common people will say I have sciatica or I have arthritis. Well, have you been diagnosed? Did you get an MRI? No. You have to know what is the problem or, you know, there could be potential for exacerbating the problem. And so again, it's it's very simple, such as for some people you don't want to round, for some people you don't want to arch, for people, for example, with spinal fusions, you don't want to twist. So there are so many different things that um, it all depends on what you're going to do. For people with sciatica or with piriformis, what you need to do is you need to stretch out the all of the tissues, the muscles, the you know, in, in your buttock. Okay. So, yeah. So, as well as SI joint too, because that's what I have is the SI joint um, disorder and it hurts right in your buttocks. And I, I, I have found that um, some of the topicals, I have CBD oil that my masseuse um, or my massage therapist in Arizona would use CBD oil on me. That helped. Um, I found this fantastic brace on Amazon. So if anyone has sciatica or SI joint, it wraps around your thigh and then it wraps around your hips. And I wear that when I walk and it has made a million percent um, difference. Now I wasn't on opioids. I was on um, what's called Voltaren, um, the generic of Voltaren. Um, I have rheumatoid arthritis and I have degenerative osteoarthritis. And so I know this is going to progress. I do everything I can to take those supplements that I'm a big advocate for. We got to keep that calcium, ladies. We have to keep that calcium. Drink your milk, eat your ice cream, eat your cheese, and take your calcium. Vitamin D affects our bones majorly. So I, I am an advocate and all my listeners are going to be like, oh God, don't let her get on her soapbox. She does this all the time, but I'm an advocate because I was in the medical field. I started in nursing and I was in the medical field for 27 years before going into my life coaching practice. Um, I've had very bad experiences with medical where especially because it's so common, one in five people, they love to, they don't want to deal with, with, um, the physical therapy, sending you to physical therapy, um, which personally, I don't think that that worked well for me, but I think the yoga would work better, but also they like to throw out generic diagnosis terms, especially rheumatologists. If they don't see you coming in, in agony, walking with a cane, they think you have fibromyalgia. It is the catch all phrase of rheumatologists and it's very frustrating and I refuse to go to another one. I've had this experience um, with three different ones and I told my husband, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to find my own homeopathic holistic ways to deal with this. So talking to you is oh, fantastic. A yoga therapist listeners is probably a new term for you and I had, and I'm going to shout her out. Her name was, is Chris and she's a massage therapist in Arizona. And she had a background in orthopedics and she had a background, uh, medical background. And she would do these deep tissue massages that would change my life. I mean, every week that she would do those massages, it, it changed everything. So sometimes it can be muscular too, right? So when, when you're talking about pain, and I actually, when I was doing my marketing communications work, I worked for a top ranked pain specialist in San Antonio. So I learned a lot about that working through him. And so there are different kinds of pain. There is neurological mm -hmm. and there is musculoskeletal. Yep. And so they are very different. Um, and that's why, of course, Traditionally, body work, whether it be massage therapy, whether it be physical yoga or Tai Chi, whatever, typically those help for musculoskeletal, but they can also work for neurological depending on what it is. Mm, I love that. I love it because neuro, we're talking some nerves, 
So if we are clearing out and stretching out the muscles, then a lot of times we're freeing up some of those nerves that are being irritated or pinched off, right? Does that make sense? Right. Okay. And I can, um, I can give some examples from my, from my doctor that's in the book. So each chapter of my book has, it gives the life story in a nutshell of my guru and all of their challenges, because we all face challenges. And then it talks about their wisdom overall. And then it gives five easy tips that the doctors or whomever share. And then I have all different kinds of supporting evidence and personal testimonials. And then I have a section called give it a try, but I'll read to you. It's Dr. Fishman, Dr. Lawrence Fishman. He's based out of New York and it's his five easy tips. And number one, get a diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> and I already talked to you about that. So I'm going to skip that number two, and you'll see how it's different for each one. Find relief from herniated discs. And that's what I was Yes. I couldn't think. Usually the pain of herniated discs can be eased with back bending yoga poses like sphinx, fish, or bridge. And by the way, in my book, whenever I have a term like fish, sphinx, or bridge in the index, it explains what it is. And then it has a link to um, how to do it and why to do it that's on my website. Nice. I love that. It is essential to know which side the disc is protruding to before attempting any particular yoga position. And again, that's why you have to talk to your doctor. Number three, soothe dull lower back aches. And that's more what I for life still work on. So I don't have any pain anymore, but I still have to work on, I can get the dull and that's what I hear most from the people I work with. For those whose diagnosis confirms no neurological issues, building core strength is helpful. Too often people strain their back when their abdominal and limb muscles are not doing the work. Planks and sun salutations can help by building core support to counteract the back muscles overexerting themselves. While every lineage of yoga may have a different variation. Some salutations incorporate gentle back bends and forward folds, partial inversions with downward dogs and dorsiflexion, which is, well, you know what dorsiflexion is, but it's when you're, and plantar flexion with your foot. Number four, address piriformis syndrome. I myself have had piriformis syndrome, so I totally understand what it is, but this is I always hear people say they have sciatica and often it's piriformis. When piriformis syndrome is causing problems, it can be offset by opening the spaces between the piriformis muscle and the buttocks and the sciatic nerve on the offending side. And again, I kind of talked about that before, so I'm not gonna go with it, into it, but he talks about specifically what to do. And number five, counteract the facts of spondylo spondylolisthesis. And spondylosis. Thank you. Yes, there's something Often, called ankylizing spondylosis, which is something that I, I thought I had as well. And that's, do you, I'm glad you brought that up because that's an extremely um, painful and progressive um, disease. So this is good that it mentions that. And he says it's often caused by a sports injury. So it can happen at any age. And it um, it occurs when one vertebra, vertebra slides usually forward onto the other one beneath it. Stretching and strengthening the lower back is often beneficial. So he goes on, but it, it just kind of wanted to give an example of how depending on what is causing your pain, you have to address it differently. I love that you gave us examples because your book is really all about mind, body, and spirit. And of course, everyone knows that I believe your mental health overspills into your physical health. So we have to work on our joy and our self-love and clearing and healing those traumas and releasing things that no longer serve us. And when and I know that you know from the gurus you talk to and yourself that when 
you haven't dealt with those traumas, a lot of PTSD, um, people that have been, you know, abused, holding on to that, or while you're in it, you know, um, I was walking with a cane. My back pain was so bad at 38 years old when I was in a domestic violence um, relationship. So I know the emotional overspill into my physical made such a complete difference. So in combination with the yoga and the retreats and the cleansing and the clearing, our physical health inevitably will get better. So in our last few minutes, as we finish up, I want you to tell everyone where we can find our fantastic, beautiful yoga therapist, Ms. Deborah. How do we reach out to you? What are your websites? All that fun stuff. Most of the places that I'm at is under my name, Deborah, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, Charnes, C-H-A-R-N-E-S. I have a YouTube channel and I have a lot of helpful um, videos on YouTube in English and in Spanish. And again, my YouTube channel is just my name, Deborah Charnes. Um, Instagram, it's my name, Deborah Charnes. My website is DebraCharnes.com. And on Facebook, I actually have other ones. It's the T H E Namaste N A M A S T E and Council C O U N S E L. And those are, and I, I'm also a, you know, I'm, I'm on TikTok and I'm on Twitter, but I'm not, I'm not very active in those. <laughs> I love that you make it easy. Cause I do too. I'm like, just put in life coach Marine. You'll find me. I'm everywhere, you know, on all of those platforms. So that's fantastic. So listeners, uh, Deborah charns.com and YouTube Deborah charns and the namaste council on Facebook as well. Right. Did I get that right? right. Yeah um now and my, well my website also so i mean the website you can go to debracharns.com or the namaste council and you'll get it oh okay okay or the namaste council and of course your lovely book is available and where is it available and there you go there if you're on youtube guys there's the cover i'll have that on her promo as well we're going to put a, a copy of the cover and of course you're probably at barnes and noble amazon all those fun places where we can find your book online it's pretty much everywhere and i think it's really cool that also all over the world you can find it online and so uh you know i, I just kind of get a kick out of that as far as in stores it traditionally is more in independent bookstores and also in yoga studios and in health food stores. Uh, so on my on my social media, periodically I will you know mention where where it's available. Um, Fantastic, I love that. Did you do a a Kindle version and or and or did you do the um, audio as well book or? I am dying to do the audio. <laughs> yes, and I'm also considering doing large print. Oh, nice. So those are my book. Well, first of all, my book was only published June 6th. <gasps> so it's, it's fairly new and it did already get one award. Hopefully it'll get more, but, <laughs> but it already got one award and it did already rank number one in several categories, um, you know, at, during the launch, because of course at launch, you know, there's a lot of promotion behind it. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah. it's, it's fairly new. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a new baby. Old. It is. <laughs> so I hope to, I hope to within the next year do large print and possibly audio as well. Awesome. Well, my listeners are wonderful in supporting guests, and you know this is, sounds like something that um, this community would definitely be interested in because we are about mind, body, and um, soul to to heal and to be our best selves. So. As we wrap up, since we always talk about heavy stuff on my podcast, let's end with some fun stuff. And my new segment is called That Tastes Funny. And this segment is, I want to know something that you eat that most people would be like, <laughs> that most people would be like, ew, tell me what, ta what would taste funny to us that you love. It tastes delicious. <laughs> so I, as, as part of my body, mind, um, 
in Ayurveda, we call it a Dina Charya, which is your entire lifestyle routine. And as a yoga therapist, I'm always guiding people in their entire lifestyle. And one of the things that I have to do is I have to consume sesame seeds all the time. And um, I love tahini. Oh. And of course, you know, if, you know, it, of course, falafel with tahini is delicious, but I'm not going to be able to make it. If I make it, it's going to taste bad. So what I do, this may sound crazy, and also I'm vegan. And okay. so, and, and I'm, I have to eat, follow a low glycemic diet because I'm diabetic. Mm, um, yes. But I take zero drugs. So I take zero drugs. Yay. And so um, I will eat sugar-free vegan ice cream, typically chocolate or vanilla. And then I pour tahini on it. You know how you might put like chocolate syrup? I pour tahini on it and it's for me the best. I, I love, see, this is fun. This is like probably my best segment that I, I've ever had. I've had some interesting questions. This is fantastic because I'm really getting to know my guests with this. Um, yeah, that would be a no for me. Um, but I, 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 I variety. It's like sweet and savory at the same time. Okay. Okay. I'm a very uh open-minded um as far as my palate goes. I will try anything um I don't think there's anything I won't try except something involving bugs I think that would be that would be can I tell you another one yes yes so I because of my low glycemic diet I cannot eat white potatoes Mm -hmm. but I can eat sweet potatoes and so I will bake my sweet potatoes with nothing, you know, and I would never eat butter. It's like, I never ate butter my whole life. To me, it was just like, you gotta be kidding. I'm just going to eat fat. (laughs) So I would never do that. And so I take my baked sweet potato and I pour tahini on it. Now that sounds good. That sounds delicious. I, I am on board with the sweet potato not so much ice cream. That sounds delicious because I I like any kind of sauces on stuff. I, I'm I'm really big on savory stuff. So that would be like putting sour cream on it almost. You know, it's just tahini is pretty much sour cream mixed with a bunch of um um other spices. So that sounds yummy. So listeners, uh that's gonna wrap it up for today. Go try a sweet potato with tahini on it. I am um all about it. Um you have been such a joy. Thank you for all your nuggets of wisdom, all of your stories, your experiences, and your bright light and your beautiful smile and for being a guest with us today. I cannot thank you enough for the hour you just gifted me. Thank you, Deborah. I thank you. It has been just, I'm so glad to have been with someone who talks a lot. (laughs) Uh, It's beneficial now. (laughs) All right, listeners, that's going to wrap us up for today for this week's episode. I really hope you enjoyed Deborah as much as I did. And I'll have all of her links where you can reach out to her and you can go get her book today from the boxing ring to the ashram. And as I close up a little bit of housekeeping for me, you know where to find me. I am now a master life coach. So find me at lifecoachmaureen.com. All of my info is there. My books, my dog is more enlightened than I am. And my dog is my relationship coach are available. And um, at the time of this airing, hopefully my third book will be published. I'm in the process and it is a children's book about mindfulness. So it's going to be a really fun book that you can get for your little ones for Christmas. And then of course we have our boutique, my dog is everything.net where I make the homemade healthy treats for your furry babies. We also have healthy kitty treats now and lots of products and fun stuff for them. So go check it out. You can order online. Uh, My dog is everything.net. I love you all for listening. Please, please let's build this community because I just, I'm feeling the love. 
I really am feeling the love. I'm getting more comments, more people saying they love the guests. They love the topics and it all pertains to all of us because we're humans. And this is where we embrace our humanness. This is your safe space. And you're welcome to reach out to me if you're going through any kind of mental health issues or just have questions or comments or would like to be a guest yourself. Um, I, I love and embrace every, every comment, all positivity, welcome. And I just thank you all. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here with me. And until next week, I love you all and bye.